She's a social entrepreneur, an author, and a philanthropist. Nancy Lublin's online marketing and social media prowess has empowered a new generation of doers. Her first foray into the nonprofit world was the founding of Dress for Success. It gave disadvantaged women a helping hand by providing professional attire. But Dress for Success was much more than that. It promoted economic independence, networking, and career development tools to help them succeed. Fifteen years after its launch, Dress for Success is now in 19 countries. But more importantly, it has helped over 850,000 women work towards self-sufficiency. Named one of the world's 50 greatest leaders by Fortune magazine and one of Schwab's Social Entrepreneurs of the Year, she currently serves as CEO of DoSomething.org, one of the world's largest organizations dedicated to young people and social change. Do Something boasts over 6 million online users, with each committing themselves to impact their community's causes. She's not done yet. Her latest venture is a first, and it's potentially a huge game changer. It's a crisis text line providing a 24-7 support line for young people who may be grappling with emotional issues. Growing rapidly since its creation in 2011, counselors currently receive 15 million texts each day. Nancy joins us now to discuss the impact of the next generation of social activism. Welcome to Full Frame. I don't know if I have time to come talk to us. You're, <laughs> yeah, well, let's start. Let's talk. Start there. You've started three nonprofits. I apparently have an aversion to making money. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but I was going to say they've all been successful. I mean, they've done well. Um, what got you interested in this? I mean, did your parents say, we want you to grow up and be a philanthropist? No, uh, they all wanted me to be a lawyer. Um, I th at, in the early 70s, if you were a girl with a lot of opinions, everybody sent you to law school. So I went to law school and hated it. Uh, it's not a place for entrepreneurs. It's the place where ideas go to die. And I'm an entrepreneur. I think, you're, I, think I was born this way. I think entrepreneurs are born. I'm not sure they're made. Um, well, Dress for Success, you started that with 5,000. I mean, yeah. I gave the introduction, you know it's success. I mean, it, it, at the time you started it, it did you say, okay, this is going to end up in like 19 countries and then I'll move on to something else? <laughs> I mean, you couldn't have imagined that. No, I, I didn't. I don't think I imagined it was going to be that big, uh, but I think I always knew I would leave, um, which is a little strange about me. Most, most entrepreneurs build something and they leave in a pine box or a stretcher, right? Like, it's your one thing for life. But I, I truly am to my core an entrepreneur. I get bored really easily. Um, and I, I'm constantly thinking of new ideas and, and things that should be started. Do something.org. I've heard you talk about this. Um, it wasn't do something.org when you got there. It was do everything.org in many respects. I mean, uh, listening to you talk about it, it almost sounded like it was a disaster. Talk to us about why someone who's done very well for herself would want to go in and do something like this. Um, I was 30, and I was getting headhunted for lots of jobs after Dress for Success, but I don't think anybody was really taking me seriously. I think people think entrepreneurs are crazy, and we are, but I, I think the assumption is that we're really good at vision, and we're really good at the creation moment, but we're not great managers. And so I took something really messy, and I wanted to prove that um, I could execute. And so I purposefully took something that was a disaster um, and turned it around. So they had just laid off 21 out of 22 people. Um, there was $75,000 left in the bank, but they were $250,000 in debt. Mm. They had no office space. I mean, it was, it was as bad as it gets. And you, you mentioned, I've, I've heard you say this, it was aimed at kids, but it went from like three to 40 or whatever. It was yeah. kind of crazy, wasn't it? Plus parents and teachers, yeah. which is everybody. So um, yeah, we had to really focus on making something for someone, which is, I think, what makes companies for-profit or not-for-profit great. Just making something because you have the ability to make it doesn't mean that anyone's going to use it or that it's valuable to someone. And so we really laser focused on teens. There was not an organization in the youth space that didn't require an adult. And so our basic rules that do something are we never require an adult, money, or a car. Because uh, that's not how most 16 and 17 year olds live. But most 16 and 17 year olds live this way. At least this is the persona that we give them as a society. They're on, they're texting or they're playing video games and they're disinterested and yet you're engaging them. But texting and video games does not mean disinterested. It means they're interested in what's coming the, to them in their pocket and in their, their phone. But that's the perception of young people right. and it's totally wrong. Totally right? wrong. Totally wrong. They're super engaged. 
they're super engaged and they're engaged, um, they're switched on to what's going on in the community. They're um, spending in different ways. So this is the generation that made Tom's Shoes a multi-billion dollar company. Um, they really care about the planet. They care about social change. And so we're going where they are. We're going on their phones. So we have 3.7, I think, as of today, million members. And we should be 5 million members by the end of this year. And that's really because we're a mobile first company. But you're kind of turning things on its head in, in many respects. Because I know a lot of people are like, I've, I've got a nonprofit. I'm going to figure out some way to get in front of Bill Gates. And I'm going to get a big, <laughs> giant paycheck. And life's going to be great. And your whole thing is kids. Now, kids, they, they can't say, Nancy, I love this. Here's the big check. It's not how it works. No, I mean, and by the way, if I did have five minutes in front of Bill Gates, he would leave without his wallet. So I would also. <laughs> be happy to have five minutes in front of Bill Gates. Um, and we don't ever fundraise from young people. We probably could make a lot of money off of our members, but we want their time and their talent, um, not their treasure. So um, we're mostly funded by companies who want access to those young people. So we do great campaigns. We're doing a campaign right now to recycle torn and stained clothing, which would otherwise clog landfills. And we work with H&M, and you can drop your clothes off at H&M stores. And we will collect over 400,000 pounds of clothes mm -hmm. in about six weeks. So it's, these are big-scale campaigns with over 100,000 kids participating. This is, this is big-scale stuff. This it's, is not little bake sales. Well, no, it's Mount Everest. Um, I mentioned to you that I, I uh, read the book and was confused by it. Uh, <laughs> talk to us about this XYZ factor um, and just some of the things that you've learned from the young people that uh, are now embedded in here that I can't quite figure out. So uh, they're different. They're different from us. Um, I grew up with two kinds of peanut butter. There was Skip and there was Jiffy. <laughs> and I remember it was a big deal when there was crunchy and smooth. And now you have... Um, you know, nut-free peanut butter, and you have sodium-free and fat-free, and like every di like 30 different kinds of peanut butter in the store. And I remember having three channels on the television, and I had to physically get up and turn the channels. And now, forget the thousand cable channels; they're not even watching TV; they're online. It's it's a very different mindset, and we've found that that translates to the workforce also. That the workplace is different. Um, so we wrote a book as a team called X Y Z Factor because we keep winning awards of best place to work. And so we wrote a book that explains all our special sauce. You know, the interesting thing is I stopped listening to you when you said they don't watch TV anymore. <laughs> I, it was a spear right through the heart. But we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should call you. Online. I, maybe Online. I should text you on your crisis text line, um, which I want to talk to you about. Because there's a funny side to you, obviously. Um, but there's a very serious side to you. Because I've heard you talk about uh, some of the texts that you've gotten, which are, are quite moving yeah. and, uh, and terrible. Uh, and what a resource, and what a great idea. So we text a lot of kids, right? Every week we're texting them, and it has huge open rates. You open every text you get. And it skews Hispanic and urban, so we're getting very diverse kids. And we have these uh, lots of people doing our campaigns, but this one side effect, because really the only people you text are your family, your friends, and do something. We have this weird side effect where whenever we send out a text about the Comeback Clothes campaign with H&M or other campaigns, we will get back a couple dozen text messages having nothing to do with that campaign, but things like, I'm being bullied and I don't want to go to school, or I'm cutting and I can't stop. And the worst message we ever got was um, probably too gruesome to talk about here, but it, it was a, an awful situation from a girl um, having to do with her father. And, and, and abuse, uh, yeah. and we'll just leave it there. Uh, and I've heard you talk about this, and obviously you're very moved by it, but the shocking quality of getting a text like that, it's, it's a cry for help in a way that you won't get with, with uh, somebody getting right. on the phone, which you've actually talked about that, right. where initially wasn't that the suggestion, call this line, and they don't want to do it. So when we got that particular message, and, and all of the messages before, we would triage it and give people the hotline numbers, and with this girl, it was such a gruesome situation. We gave her the hotline number. We didn't hear back. The next day, I said, send her this hotline number again. And we've actually never heard back from her. And I, to this day, I don't know what happened to her. And um, to tell us something so personal, so intimate, to strangers, to be that desperate for help, we realized we owed her more. And the world owed her more. And so we set out to build a crisis text line. Um, so that they could get help 
24-7 by text. We spike every day during lunch because it's private. So you wouldn't call sitting at lunchtime at school, but you can text us. So you're sitting at a lunch table and maybe your friends think you're texting someone at the next table. You're actually texting us. Um, so it's to them, text is incredibly private because there's no face-to-face, -face, there's no sound. They spill their guts to us by the third message. And the kinds of things they're telling us, 30% of the messages, can you guess what our most popular issues are? I have no so idea. I would have thought it would have been bullying because it's, it's in the news media a lot. It's suicide and depression. Mm. So very severity, I mean, real issues that they're telling us very quickly. And we're able to get them help very quickly. And because it's by text, and we're a tech company, basically, we've layered on an algorithm so that if you text in, I want to die, or I want to harm myself, that goes code orange and you go to the top of the queue. So instead of waiting chronologically, like when you call another customer service number or a hotline, we don't put you on hold if you're suicidal. We handle you right away. So the quality is good. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, this, this episode that you talked about uh, and that she never came back and you don't know what happened to her. I, I know a lot of people who would be crushed by that and think about that all the time. And yet you turned it into had to. action. I had to. Um, and it actually, it's a horrible thing that happened, but in many ways it was a catalyst for something good. I hope she knows. I mean, I hope that she's seen an interview or read an article somewhere. First of all, I hope she's safe. And then I hope she's seen that she's actually saving lots of other people's lives. We're doing rescues twice a day. We have to send police or EMT to a home to intervene in a suicide attempt. I mean, we're literally saving lives every day. So you've seen each side. I mean, you see uh, young kids who are, are willing to move mountains, and then you see them struggling. So what's your takeaway about the landscape out there? So I'm actually incredibly hopeful. I, I actually think this is an, a great generation and that these tools, like social media, mobile, uh, they're going to use for good. Some of them will be used for evil or silliness, um, you know, it's lovely that they can get food delivered more quickly and that they can find, you know, hookups more quickly thanks to Tinder. That's fine. But I'm really excited about how these tools are being used for good. Um, how Facebook has just helped out in Nepal. How Crisis Text Line is helping people um, with their mental health issues. How DoSomething.org is pushing millions of kids to do more volunteerism. And they're hungry for it. Um, I'm really hopeful. What a pleasure talking to you, you and uh, keep up the great work. Thanks. I think it's fantastic what Thanks you've done so me. far, and, and I'll keep my eye on you. I'm sure there's more great things to come. Thanks. We'll be back with more from New York City in just a moment.